That's the fourth pillar. Moving on finally to the fifth. This is, of course, the Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage. The Quran indicates that this is an obligation only for those who can afford it or manage it financially and physically. So if you're a poor peasant in Java or somewhere and you couldn't save up the money without seriously endangering your, your family, it's not one of the pillars of Islam for you. You're excused it and there's no guilt attached to that. Otherwise, it's equally incumbent upon both sexes, has to be done at least once in one's life. Now the Hajj is that dimension of Islam that most clearly binds Muslims to the Abrahamic origins of their faith. The Quran affirms that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba as the world's first place of worship. And near Mecca, the pilgrims pass a place called Majr al kabsh where it's believed that Abraham offered the sacrifice of his son in obedience to God's command. The actual rites of the Hajj are very complex and they're actually very unfamiliar. They're not like anything else in Islam. Um, very briefly, they involve a sevenfold circumambulation, walking around the Kaaba, which represents disconnection from the four points of the compass and hence worldly attachments and a focusing upon the, the presence of the divine, which is represented by the Kaaba. Um, the pilgrims will also drink from the famous well of Zamzam, which I'll talk about in a subsequent lecture. Um, they then progress rapidly seven times between two tiny hills, which are called Sofa and Marwa, which are sort of 300, 400 yards apart next to the great mosque in Mecca. They're connected nowadays by a huge walkway. Um, and in the middle is a channel for, for wheelchairs. Uh, these names mean respectively purity and humanity. And those who are interested in the symbolic significance of these rites will say that this sevenfold procession um, represents the polarity between the two aspects of man, the theomorphic and the animal. So you end up at the Mount of, of Safa. It also is an indication, and I'll talk about this a bit more later, of the Abrahamic origins of, of Islam, because it's said to commemorate um, Abraham's bondsman, bondsmaid, Hajar, in her desperate search for water for, for her son. She went seven times between these two hills. After that, the pilgrims go <coughs> to the Valley of Mina, three or four miles outside Mecca, um, where there's a huge tent city that accommodates the two million or so people that do the Hajj every year. It is, of course, the world's largest temporary gathering of humanity, with the exception only of the great Melas of Hindu India. But it's different from them in as much as the, the Melas tend to be just Indian events, whereas the Hajj is conspicuously multinational. At Mina, they just pray and meditate until they move on to the culminating ritual of the Hajj, which is at a huge plain about seven or eight miles outside Mecca called Arafat. It's A-R-A-F-A-T. Huge, very spectacular plain surrounded by bare mountains. And in the center of this, there's a hill known as the Jabal al-Rahma, the Mount of Mercy. And tradition records that the Prophet preached his final sermon there, the so-called farewell sermon. Muslim tradition also believes that it was at Arafat that Adam and Eve were reconciled to God. The rite itself at Arafat is very straightforward. It's simply called the wukuf or the standing. People stand before God and they pray. So you find this huge tent city filled with every conceivable ethnic group. Very spectacular event. All listening to and following prayers, typically in their own language. Various religious orders will hold ceremonies in their tents. And it's an authentic microcosm of, of the Muslim world. And the sense of equality is reinforced by the requirement on men not to wear their ordinary clothes, but to wear two seamless white garments, um, which recall the shrouds, which is um, all that we will wear when we are raised up to face the final judgment. And in fact, it's a common Muslim tradition to keep hold of these shrouds, these towels, which are called ihram, I-H-R-A-M, and you keep them for the rest of your life and you're actually buried in them when you die. So the standing at Arafat goes on all day, and then when the sun sets, everybody simultaneously rushes back towards Mecca, because it has to happen simultaneously. It's a great logistic problem, and the Saudis have built nine superhighways parallel to each other that take people and vehicles or walking. 
traditionally, of course, on camels and donkeys um, from, from Arafat back to Mina. At Mina, the pilgrims um, submit to the ritual known as the stoning of the pillars. These are simply bare white pillars that represent the three places where the devil appeared to tempt Abraham. Um, after this has been done, um, they have their heads shaved, if they're men, or if they're women, they can just have their heads clipped, their hair clipped, and there's a final rite of circumambulation of the Kaaba, and essentially that's the obligations of the Hajj um, completed. Some people will travel on to the city of Medina, 280 miles to the north, to pay their respects to the Prophet, although that's not unless that's not, strictly speaking, a component of the Hajj. So the Hajj is the fifth and, in a sense, the culminating rite of Islam. Hadith says that a Hajj faithfully and sincerely performed blots out all one's previous sins. It can be performed every year. Some people actually do that. But once is enough to discharge the obligation. Um, similarly, there is the lesser pilgrimage, known as the Umrah, which is much shorter, unlike the Hajj, which takes three or four days, the Umrah takes a couple of hours, um, just entails the sevenfold circumambulation of the Kaaba and the procession between Safa and Marwa. That can be done at any time of the year, but the Hajj has to be done in the month of Dhul Hijjah, at the end of the Muslim year. Everybody does it simultaneously. Um, so people go to Mecca and do this Umrah at all times of the year, and particularly in Ramadan and in another month called Rajab, the Haram, the sanctuary in Mecca, is really stuffed with people. Um, so it's the culminating moment in the Muslim life. And it's the culminating right almost in a cosmic sense. Um, it's often remarked that the basic rites of Islam are linked to the natural world. So the five prayers a day follow the movements of the sun. The zakat and Ramadan are dictated by the movements of the moon. And Hajj, also dictated, of course, because it follows this calendar by the movements of the moon, is a kind of symbolic return to the center, to the, the pivot, to the axis mundi, to the point where heaven and earth meet, where Adam and Eve were reconciled to God, and a line was hence drawn under original sin. And this reminds us that the whole Muslim life is permeated by this principle, which I'll speak of in more detail tomorrow, of dhikr, which means remembering remembrance, remembering the reality from which we came. Every one of these pillars is designed to remind us. So there are five prayers a day, one congregational prayer a week, fasting month once a year, and one hajj in a lifetime. These rites punctuate the entire Muslim life. And their purpose is clear. Islam believes that without constant dhikr, without being reminded, um, we will fall prey to our own selfish, self-centered tendencies and forget the divine reality. The human capacity for distraction and self-involvement is that strong. But as the Hadith of Gabriel, with which I, I started, makes clear, all of these five pillars are no more than the pillars of Islam. They are the support, they are the first stage, they are indispensable, however they are not the summation of the religion itself. The building itself is another matter, and that's what I'll be talking about tomorrow. I think you're well overdue for your coffee break. Um, when we come back, I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about some of the other collective aspects of the outward side of Islam, including uh, Islamic law.